Welcome to the Answer Podcast, where we bring you inspiring stories from the leaders shaping our military future. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo. Today, we're honored to have with us Lieutenant Alexis J. Sandoval, the Battalion Future Operations Officer for the 3rd Medical Battalion, 3rd Marine, Marine Logistics Group. Lieutenant Sandoval has an impressive ca career spanning over a decade with numerous awards and recognitions under his belt. We delved into his journey, his leadership experiences, and his vision for the future. But first, a quick disclaimer. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the United States Marine Corps and or Department of Defense. In this episode of the Answer Podcast, podcast we sit down with Lieutenant Alexis Sandoval to explore his distinguished career in the United States Navy and Marine Corps. From his early days as a seaman recruit to his current role as a battalion future operation officer, Lieutenant Sandoval shared his insights on leadership, the importance uh, of continued education, and he ed and his education on volunteer volunteerism. The episode offers a deep dive into the life of a service member committed to excellence both on and off the battlefield. Without further ado, now we welcome Lieutenant Alexis Sandoval. Welcome uh, to the Answer Podcast, uh, Alexis. How are you doing tonight? Or today. <laughs> very good. Good morning. Good evening. I'm doing very good. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, appreciate it to be here in the Answer Podcast, uh, taking the time. I know for you, it's Sunday, uh, 9 a.m. For me, is Saturday here in the in this, this side of the world at 8 p.m. Um, so, as I mentioned in the introduction, let's let's hear who is uh, Lieutenant Alexis on the wall. Uh, well, let me introduce myself. Um, I am Alexis, or they call me Alex. I am from Los Angeles, California, um, born and raised um, from LA. Um, I moved around a lot in LA from Compton to West LA to Northeast LA. Uh, and that's where I settled majority of my time I was there. I also got recruited out of there at Northeast LA recruiting station. Yep, so so when you were back in LA, so what was the make you, what inspired you to actually get into the Navy? Because I see in your, in your bio that you are listed as a seaman recruit. So can you talk to us, like, how, what was the inspiration for you to actually join the Navy? Uh, I joined the Navy a couple of reasons why. Mm -hmm. um, during LA, uh, when I was in high school, okay. uh, there was this program um, that they, while you're enrolled in high school, they, they pay for your tuition. So I okay. always wanted to be a firefighter when I was young. Mm. So that kind of inspired me to take a class of a BMT. Um, and because of the EMT course, that's where I started falling in love with a little bit with uh, medicine okay. and firefighting. Okay. So that's the reason why I would join the Navy. The Navy gave me the opportunity to get firefighter training and also medical training. And that's how my recruiter was able to kind of tie it in of what you want to do um, mm. to the Navy. So with the firefighter training, medical training, mm -hmm. and travel, I think that was a, a done deal. Uh, the, bi the big reason why I wanted to join, though, is um, I always had the, the sense of uh, provide service back okay. to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, my mm -hmm. mother came from uh, Mexico at a very young age, mm -hmm. uh, and she had a very young age at 14, 15 years old. And... During her time of working, she, I think she gave she gave me the sense of like, you know, we are getting a lot of government services. Mm -hmm. You also have to give back, and I think that's one of the thing that drove me to provide more service back to to the United States because the opportunities that the U.S. gave me, and I I love it. So the Navy gave me the traveling, gotcha. gave me the service, and mm -hmm. also gave me the training to the medical field. So I did got recruited as an E one. Okay. Um, I, I got recruited in November. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a funny story because when I joined, my mom didn't even know. Um, okay, so she, you're like uh, trying to recruit and your mom even didn't know that you were recruiting. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. She actually disapproved of me uh, wow. to join. Okay. Because I was her, I was her oldest child. I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was the, the bedrock of the family. Mm -hmm. And by her, and during the time was Iraq and Afghanistan was high. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. She did not approve of me of yeah. leaving and leaving the nest. Mm -hmm. So I, when I turned 18, uh, that's where I started engaging with my recruiter. And I, I, and I still talk to my recruiter. Her name's uh, Lydia Hood. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's amazing. Uh, she, gave me, she gave me a lot of the tools to 
do good on the ASVAB, and I, I'm truly great, uh, appreciate her. Uh, but when I joined, I didn't have told my mom. Um, I didn't come home one day. It was in May of 2008. Mm -hmm. I was still in high school. I still haven't graduated yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I didn't, even, I didn't even come home. And the next day, I came home. My mom was wor really worried about me. Uh, I was saying, where'd you go? Doesn't, you've never missed home. What happened? And uh, I was like, well, I finally joined the military. I'm wow. like, and she's like, no, tell me or no. I'm like, yes, and I showed her the paperwork, and I'm like, I'm leaving November 16th, now. and she finally kind of, like, digests the information and kind of, kind of, you know, well, sad, but happy yeah. that I took a step forward to do something. Yeah, no, most definitely, because you you enter in the, in the, in the hot, you know, where everything was heated in the Middle East, 2008, um, and, and I bet your mom was like, no, mijo, you, you, you're going to stay here. I don't want you to go war. Um, now, so, so I, I know you, you mentioned the, the Navy offered you the, the firefight and the medical experience. Do you, do you actually, uh, verify any other branches or it was just Navy at that moment? So it, it's funny that you say that, um, because two years before that, uh, my cousin, uh, married a, uh, soldier, an army ranger. And I remember engaging in him, showing me these pictures of his school, the airport school, and and actually was telling me, "Hey, want to join? Want to join?" Uh, I'm like, "Yes, I want to join." And at the time, I was 16, so I couldn't do anything. So I waited to 17, and that's when I started engaging my mother. Hey, I want to join, and she was like, "Uh, no, I, I don't know." So and it's funny because uh, my cousin's uh, husband at the time, uh, he was a staff sergeant uh, in the army. So he was able to engage with the recruiter and actually be able to, uh, I was able to practice the ASVAB test. Mm -hmm. And um, and I guess I didn't do very well okay. because uh, he didn't come back and engage with me anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked at the recruiting mall. So every time I saw him and I was at, at 18, he never said anything. Uh, so the next step after the army, I was like, well, I still want to join. Yeah. So I went from the army, I went to the next branch, which, which was the Navy. There you go. Okay, and then uh, definitely after your mom you said, like, okay, mijo, now you're going. So you took the ass back, did well, and then what was next? And, and then you, you said the ship day for you, and then you went out to the basic. So can you can you take us to that travesty? Yeah, so for me, uh, when I left in November 2008, it was my first time leaving, traveling by myself. I went to Great Lakes, Great Lakes, Illinois, uh, for boot camp for mm -hmm. the Navy. Um, after the, tra uh, after the training, initial training that we had, I go to a school, uh, which is our MOS school okay. equivalent. AIT for uh, us. Yeah. Or, yes. And I went to Corman school there. Uh, I went to core school, which is still in Great Lakes. Now it's moved to San Antonio now. Uh, so it's pretty, uh, cool to say like, Hey, I was trained in Illinois on Great Lakes. So from boot camp, I uh, went to core school. Uh, in core school, I also went to another school after that, which is a dental strand. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a hospital man, and also I was uh, working as my sub -cat a subspecialty was dental. So I was also a dental te a technician. Um, and after that, it was basically I was in, in Great Lakes from November, and I graduated in core school in May of 2009. I went to a follow-on school for dental two months later. And then again, I went to another school, which was now in Camp Pendleton, to become a field medical technician, okay. uh, to training with the with the the Marine Corps. So technically, my whole training, initial training, took around um, eight or nine months. Wow. Um, I didn't check into my first uh, duty station until October 2009 wow. in Camp Lejeune, Carolina. Yeah, so you basically f spent spent your first year like do, uh, school to school to school to learn your your craft until you were able to actually go to your first unit uh, duty station. So now after you finished like all the schools uh, that the, the Navy prepare you to actually join the Marine Corps, um, how was your first duty station like coming from LA? Now going to your first duty station, how was that transition for you for for Sandoval, Alex? I think it was very interesting. Uh, I love talking about it because I went from LA. I'm all city guy. I'm a city boy mm -hmm. uh, going to North Carolina, where it's like it was brand new area. I remember landing in a in a Jacksonville, North Carolina, and I'm like, where am I? <laughs> What am I doing here? The trees are there's lots of trees. Miles. A lot of green everywhere. 
Yes, and it was a, it was a very different environment yeah. for me. So uh, it was out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was actually was very excited because um, I chose to go with to be stationed with the Marine Corps, um, and because at the time there was a big uh, budget crisis and there was a, people were not PCSing to duty stations, mm -hmm. so they're actually people selecting their place to go. People were going overseas to Italy. Um, I was like, I don't care. I just want to go in with the Marine Corps. So they was like, do you want to go to North Carolina? Sure. Send me to North Carolina. Mm. So that's actually, uh, you know, good for me that I took that route to go to North Carolina because I went to uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, or Camp Lejeune, what they call it now, uh, which is a very big military base. And also went to Cherry Point, which is an aviation base, which is an hour away from um, Camp Lejeune. Uh, so that was my first duty station. Mm. And that's where I actually learned a lot of my craft and I, I did very well in my first duty station. Yeah, I bet. The, I mean, it's interesting to to see coming from, you know from from a big city like a busy city like a LA now going to the East Coast like you're going from west to east and and, and I bet like you're like young, nineteen, twenty years old, like getting all these experiences um, for you. Uh, now, so so what's next after your first duty station? What happened to Alexis after you actually went to North Carolina and, and experienced your first duty station? So within the first two years, um, I won um, sale of the quarter uh, uh, for MLG, and that opened up a lot of doors for me um, because that was a, I was able to choose kind of what unit I want to go to deploy. Uh, they gave me the option, do I want to go to Afghanistan to one of the detachments, or do I want to go be stationed with the MU with one of the COB 24s? Uh, COBs, uh, COBs that is in Lejeune, which is a combat logistic battalion. So I actually chose that route. Uh, by me choosing that route, I was able to be stationed with a different unit um, for, I would say, over two years. Um, and that is my first deployment that I went on uh, with the 24th Mew. And that within that Mew, because like I said, I was I, I was really doing really well. I was learning my craft and I had a lot of good uh, accolades of uh, getting qualifications very quickly. So it was, it was really good. That is where I met a lot more people within the ship that opened up more doors for me to be like, hey, now you're up for orders. Where do you want to go next? So I was I was excited because my first port was in uh, Naval Station Broda. And I was like, wow, I love this place. So actually, that's where during my deployment, I selected orders and they, they allowed me to go to Spain next. So I went from uh, Camp Lejeune, Cherry Point, on to the Mew on the ship, and then I went straight to uh, Rhoda. Yeah, so I seen I seen like in your bio right now that definitely you end up in Naval Hospital Rhoda, Spain, and then you serve as a leading petty officer for this sterile processing department and the, the director of safety petty officer. Can you speak about that job? Like, um, what do you do when you were in Spain? Like, now we're talking from LA to North Carolina, now to Spain, you have travels, I mean, in, in the first years of your career. Yeah, so when I was in Spain, uh, I, I our directorate um, in dental, we started, uh, we had a sterilization department where they sterilize all the, the dental equipment, all the surgical pieces of the hospital. So that was the, I was in charge of that um, very important uh, department because if that department would have gone down or gone south, it would uh, it will stop any operations from dental to or any other surgeries in the hospital. So it was a very important job and I actually loved it. I enjoyed it. Um, I think it was like gift wrapping every single day, um, going to the instruments, cleaning the instruments, uh, making sure they're wrapped correctly. So that was, that was fun. Uh, within that same uh, time frame, I was in charge also of the safety program. Uh, throughout my whole career, uh, since I was an E2, E3, I really enjoyed safety, occupational safety. So I took that spot in, uh, in the hospital and I actually took a very, uh, from a program that was non-existent to a very good program that it was the CO got recognition uh, from the from the, his admiral saying that we had the best program that he's seen for a while. So it, I, I enjoy those so sterilization and our occupational health at the time. Yeah, no, most definitely. Um, that's a that's a huge job. I can see. Um, and then after Spain, you actually went to Iwa Kuni, Japan, right? Yes. Yeah, so I went. I went to yeah. before I went to Kuni. I actually also went to um, 
I went to a submarine uh, duty station. Uh, I was trying to be a submarine IDC or independent duty corpsman. Um, for, so I was there for a year. Um, I didn't succeed on that, um, in that school just because I had personal family issues that I need to take taken care of. So I, I needed to um, remove myself from that community. So I went from Groton, New, New, New England. Then I went to Japan um, to, to Iwakuni. Yeah, and, and how was that experience in Japan for you, for Alex now? Iwakuni, well, I think um, that was one of my toughest duty stations that I have. Um, toughest, but rewarding. I think I learned a lot about myself at the time um, because the structure of that Marine Corps unit, I was the highest Navy representative. So I had so much responsibilities to my captain, who was my company commander. Um, I was doing uh, equal opportunity. I was doing substance abuse uh, counseling. Um, I was being the Navy uh, SEL senior enlisted leader. So I was in charge of the, the evals of my sailors, the sale of the quarters. So I had a lot of my, in my shoulders and it, it was difficult. Um, it was a very difficult uh, tour for me just because of the personalities, um, the, the work environment it was. Um, and at the same time, I was also enrolled to school I was a full-time college student at the time. So the demands of school and work, it, it was difficult. But uh, I think, like I said, it was rewarding because a lot of my great friends are from that duty station. Um, I think that's what made it best because I had the friendships I had. Yeah, so so although it was difficult, like you mentioned, it was rewarding at the same time because you, you created those friends that are going to last forever because I bet you, you have them on social media and you keep you continue talking to them and and looking for mentorships and et cetera. Um, it's great to hear. And then, so after Iwakuni, and then you went to uh, the headquarters and services company staff, non-commissioned officer in charge, and senior medical department representatives. Can you speak about that specifically? So yeah, that was my titles in uh, COC 36. COC 36, uh, yeah. So that, that was, I was a staff in COIC um, for uh, S1. Uh, for a little bit, uh, like I said, it, it was a very tough <laughs> duty station. But after that, I left CLC. I I got I, I'm one of my friends was a, a good detailer friend, so she was able to like, hey Alex, I think you will be very good for the next duty sh station, which is um, our Bumet headquarters, our medical headquarters. Okay. So that's where I went next, okay. and uh, that was a staff kind of I would say staff billet, mm. um, E six and. That was another duty station. Like I found, I found ground of uh, to grow more professionally um, because I got my bachelor's when I just checked into my next duty station, and I started my master's right after that. I checked in and I went to uh, straight to my master's, um, and that's where it, uh, another tough duty station. Just because of uh, during a time we have COVID, um, so my job there was like uh, a medical planner. Uh, we source people, source units. It created units and for them to go around the United States to uh, meet the demand that we have for COVID. Yeah, no, COVID, COVID was, uh, was a tough time for anyone. <laughs> and that was tough times. And I, and I bet um, that for you as well in Bowman uh, um, that I see here in your bio. Um, now, when, when you started to actually uh, get the idea that you wanted to switch from um, non-commissioned officer to actually officer, it started uh, during my first deployment, uh, 24th Mew. So there was three officers that um, that I met during my deployment. Um, one of them is uh, the ship's male, which the male is the medical administration officer. Um, another person that I met was uh, a the medical planner for the Mew, who coordinated basically all the plans of the of the ship. And the next male was uh, is uh, administrator was the Merco, which is the medical regulating control officer. And those three is the ones who actually inspired me to become the designer that I am right now, which is a health administrator. Um, because I didn't know that was a, administration was a thing in the, in the Navy until I met them in my deployment. And that's where I got the idea of where, because I, I, I was really good. I'm really good at policy. I'm really good at writing and remembering policy, going to the black and white kind of, and, and that's where um, it was fun for me as an administrator. So that's where, when I was in Bumed, 
Um, I was in my master programs. I was still going at it. And I finished my master's and that's where I applied for the first time to commission officer as an, uh, as an administrator. Yeah. And then how was that process? Like, uh, the packet, if you can actually share with the audience, uh, what the process was for you to actually apply for the officer and how was the selection in that time for you as well? Yes. Um, so for the, the program that I did was called the medical service and, and, in service in, in procurement program. So that is basically getting quotas who are, uh, if you're already in active duty, um, they will, they're they gonna get quotas to either from the, the um, they get certain quotas uh, for becoming an administrator. So you can go in training or you could be direct. So I already have my master's, so I was able to do the direct training route. So this medical service procurement program is, is every year. And this program, um, is basically you have to get letters of appraisals, you have to get letter of recommendations. Um, and within these uh, boards that you do for appraisals, you get interviewed one-on-one with, uh, with officers in the community to see if, they, um, if you're a really good fit for the community. Are you gonna be a good fit as a Naval officer? Are you gonna be a good fit as a, uh, as a medical service corps? So those are the three, three big criteria when uh, they, they interview you. How much do you know about the community? How much do you, how much do you like medical uh, health services in the federal system? Uh, and they test you and they ask you this question because they wanna know who you are and are, are you really gonna be a good fit for the community at the end of the day? Yeah, it sounds like a tough process, but I mean, it's not impossible. So if, if, if you're hearing right now and if you're planning to do any of this type of programs, I think the advice is to go ahead and do it because you will not know if, if you're not a fit if you don't try. Um, so keep doing it and, and you'll get it. Um, that's awesome. So now once you get selected, so what's next? So you get your job assignment or you stay, you said the administration part of the, the healthcare? Yeah, so I got, I, I got selected um, in, in Bumed and uh, I called my detailer and my detailer basically will give you choices. Uh, for the officers, a little bit different. Uh, they, they tell you, all right, Alex, I only got three, these three places, pick one. If you don't pick one, cool, you don't need to pick one, but you're not gonna be commission officer. Uh, so uh, I really wanted to be, uh, go to the Marine Corps right after that. Um, I really wanted to, uh, I like the Marine Corps. Uh, the Marine Corps has given me a lot of good opportunities and good leadership. So that's where I told my detailer, like, sir, uh, anywhere in, there's a Marine Corps billet, please send me. And they sent me to uh, Okinawa. So it was my first time in Okinawa, uh, my second time in Japan. So I was like, okay, I'll take it. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so that's awesome. So right now, so you've been stationed in Okinawa as the battalion, uh, future battalion, uh, battalion officer, right? So how's the work right now for you? How, uh, what's the experience that you have right now as a, as a future battalion officer right now? So my first year that I, um, for my first, uh, first year as an officer, I was actually first the battalion adjutant, uh, and the legal officer. So okay. that was an experience. Okay. Um, and I, I love to talk to my exo about it and because that was a challenging job as an O2, um, being, uh, in charge of the administration and talking to the CEO, the XO, uh, their demands, it, it was a very difficult job. So after my first year, uh, my XO asked me, Hey, Alex, I know you like the planning stuff. I know you've been, that's the route. Do you want to go? Do you want to go to school? Um, I'm like, sure. I want to go to school, but are you willing to go to three month school? And I'm like, uh, three months school. Okay. Where? So he actually offered me to go to expedition, expedition warfare school, which is a captain level, uh, PME school for the, the Marine Corps. Um, and that's where you learn how to be a good planner, be a good captain. And I, I went to that school. I graduated in, uh, this year in March. And that's where I start rolling into the FOPs. Um, you know, and like, I always wanted to be a planner. Um, like I said, from the mute perspective, from well, when in my first deployment, uh, I just think the, pl the planning aspect, the planning, um, anything, any planning event, I think is fun. And I'm actually having lots of fun right now doing it. Um, I just finished an organs, um, an exercise right now. We, um, I went to the Resolute Dragon. So that it was cool to be there and also plan at the same time. And then 
So, so how was your uh, admin experience? Like, that's that's funny to hear that you actually went to the admin side of the house as an S one. So I saw I saw your your, your profile. Um, can you speak about like uh, what was the main task as an admin officer at that time before we go back well, to the full? So, the, as an admin officer, I was in charge of basically everything that is uh, personal management and uh, human resource. You could call it. Uh, for me, it was very easy. Um, because I had the background already of the Navy and I also had background in the Marine Corps. So a lot of the programs that were asking about anything that dealt with uh, program, uh, personal management, I already had an idea. Um, when I was with COC 36, one of my main roles was be to be an admin officer as an enlisted member. We call them CPPAs. Uh, they will control the pay, the, the check-ins, check-outs. So I had already had a little good, ba good background. So as an adjutant, um, it kind of fit in. I just need to learn the the prog uh, the process in the battalion, uh, learning how to be more uh, IT oriented because I started creating SharePoint sites. I started integrating with me, uh, Microsoft Teams, and uh, I started getting nerdy, you could call it, uh, because I was trying to be what is the most e efficient way to process um, uh, requests. How can I use technology uh, in my advantage instead of doing things, uh, you know, on the taskers? It's just just uh, I just wanted to ensure that it was easy for me to manage it. Um, so as I said, it was it was easy uh, just because I, I'm an administrator by trade. Um, so, but it was hard because of demand. No, for sure. Uh, I'm a log I'm a logistics officer, and and I know a little bit of the admin side and administrative, but I. I I don't relate too much to it. I, I'll stay in logistics. Let's keep it that way. I'll let the S1 do the paperwork. Um, yes. Now, as the Battalion Future Operation Officer, what are some of the key challenges you face in ensuring operational readiness? Uh, anything that you can share? Yes, uh, I think um, it's perfect that you as a loggy. I think there's um, this is a, I think the way that a a planner successful is by ensuring the you, the staff is synchronized. And I think that's the biggest challenges that we have with, I think with any organization right now is communication. Communication is the hardest. Um, everybody perceives, uh, gets information, perceive information, they make assumptions. Um, I'm more of a check in the box, make sure that are we done this or when are we doing this? Um, and I make sure that it goes to, it's followed to the end. Because um, I I think as a, me as a planner, I still provide a customer service and I put it as an admin guy. I'm providing customer service to whoever's going to go outside the door. Every person that is deploying, I got to ensure that I have met all the wickets. I have met all the war fighting functions. And I make sure that the staff is synchronized together and we communicate um, to ensure that everybody's in the same table. Everybody knows what's going on. Um, I think that is the key to be a good a planner. What is currently what has happening now, I think with uh, within my day-to-day -day is the communication. I think it could be better, mm -hmm. but again, I, we're moving forward from uh, from the, as a new FOPSO here, uh, coming from an exercise, I see the challenges. Now I'm able to see that, take it back a little bit and figure out how as a team we could grow better. Nice, and then you mentioned that you recently went to the actual Warfire exercise. Can you speak uh, anything that, that you wanna actually share with the audience and how was that back in Japan? Yes, uh, it was uh, it was good. Uh, Resolute Dragon is one of the uh, bilaterally we work with our partners here in, in Japan. Uh, we train together, and as a medical person, we train with medical, and we try to figure out how like, this is what you do, this is what we do. Um, trying to translate that, and if anything happens um, for any uh, humanitarian reasons, we know how what they're gonna bring to the table and what they what we are gonna bring to the table. So that was really good, a really good experience. Um, I was able to see a lot of good uh, things that our partners do, a lot of advanced stuff they do. I'm like, wow, um, I haven't thought about that. And that's a really good thing to bring back to the group. How can we make it better? Um, it, it's just, it was really good. Um, the next exercise we're doing is, again, some same thing bilaterally. And it's we're just getting better as partners with our host nation. Um, it's just, it's great to see what's coming out in the future. Yeah, no, that's that's something that we do in the military, right? So we work with our partner nations and we share experiences in our AARs or we share our, our point of views and then amongst with them and then we go back and forth and they see our perspective and we see them. 
it's great that uh, you're doing that as, as a future operation officer because that's that's what you do, right? So you need to plan ahead and see the future and, and start planning and then tell your boss, like, hey, we should be doing this um, and plan because, like, the next work is going to be X, Y, and C, and, and, you know, we go from there. So it's great to hear. Uh, and then what's next for you? So I know you're doing your future operation officer, battalion future operation officer. So what's next for Lieutenant um, Sandoval? So next for me, um, I got orders. Um, I'm leaving uh, Third American Battalion in a couple months. I'm going to USS Iwo Jima next. Um, my first deployments, I like going back to my first deployment because that ship, I wasn't enlisted there, and I'm coming back now to the same ship that I deployed. Um, so that's pretty pretty cool to see. I'm, I was there as an enlisted, and now I'm going to be coming back as an officer. So I'll be the medical administration officer um, as long as everything works out in the next couple months. All the stars line up. All the screenings is good. So that's me going next to the medical. Um, I become an administration yeah. uh, for the ship. And for future long goals, um, I'm trying to still stick to become a uh, better planner, mm -hmm. uh, stick to my specialty. Um, I'm excited for that after. Yeah. And then you obviously keep mentioning that you have uh, get a, a advanced education in healthcare administration. So how do you think you contribute that to your effectiveness in your roles within the military, in this case, in the Marine Corps? And so it, it, I think right now when we as a planner, we the same thing, we talk about the same thing about healthcare, quality of healthcare within the planning aspect. So I yes, I'm, I'm moving forces. I am planning forces to go to out the door. But well, at the same time, we I as administrator, I'm always thinking about quality measures. How do we how are our members going to get treated? Um, is it the same services? So that that's a good thing about me as an administrator who who has a background in healthcare. I'm always thinking about those ways. Like we're supposed to still meet the same demand as a regular hospital in the field. Uh, our quality should not be down no matter what. So that's the, how I bring it back. Next, when I go to the ship, I'll be the medical administrator officer. So the same thing. I'm able to drive those those measures, make sure that the quality does not deviate for our service members. So that is, I'm a very, I'm very big on that. Um, that's the reason why I got into healthcare, um, especially in the administration side, administration side, because I have a passion of learning healthcare and putting into practice, not just talk about let's fix the healthcare. Like, cool, how are we fixing it? And that's the things that I like to see uh, the measures that we're providing good care for our service members. Nice. And then, um, so you're talking about education and what, so what advice would you give to service members considering pursuing further education while on active duty? I, I think, um, I like to talk to my sailors and my Marines about this is like, you shouldn't have, uh, you shouldn't just because you're active duty doesn't mean like I'm going to stop or I, if I have TA, I don't have a lot of TA or my command is not, um, approving me. Well, I will say if you don't want to go to the route of uh, having the TA be paid for by the government or the military, say you could pay off your own pocket. So that's what happened to me. Uh, when I was with uh, the Marine Corps in Iwakuni, I had no TA anymore. So I was like, okay, I got no TA. How am I going to pay for uh, for school? Well, I, I paid out of pocket. And that's because I, I, was, I, I was determined to complete um, my degree in a certain time frame. Um, and I find any scholarships, any anything out of uh, I paid out of pocket. Like so, I was not going to going out. I was stayed in. Um, so there was a long a lot of nights that uh, I just stayed in and just to to ensure I complete my school in a certain time frame. So find anything that's available. Anything. There's so many scholarships out there. There's so many opportunities. Um, keep your chain of command informed. Tell them about you know this is what I really want to do, and they they're gonna support you as long as you have a really good plan. Yeah, more definitely. Like uh, higher educations for anyone in the serv service member in any of the ranks, not only for officers, not for enlisted, for water officer, etc. Because at the end of the day, uh, we can take that experience and, ta and transfer it to the civilian sector. Let's say something happened. I had a podcast recently with a ship water officer too from the army that he got medically retired um, at 16 years in, in of service, um, and then he had to find another you know job and and being educated helped him to find to be a CEO etc. So now he's a CEO for a company, but it's always good to actually continue higher education not only for officers but anyone 
amongst the ranks. And, and there's plenty of resources out there, not only the TA, but scholarship as uh, uh, Alex just mentioned. Now let's let's uh, transition to your volunteer and community engagement because not only you're being you know a higher education pursuing you know like any uh, more jobs etc. So you've been recognized uh, for your volunteer work within the military. Uh, what drives you to your commitment to volunteer? If you want to speak about it. Yeah. So I I think what drives me about the volunteering aspect is still giving back to the community. Yes, I'm giving back to the military. That's one service. But I think me. The volunteer events that I've chosen uh, specifically, for example, give one when I was in Cherry Point, I volunteered at the fire fire departments. I also volunteered at um, uh, to do funerals for military funerals, uh, preparing the funerals, things like that. Um, working in the uh, working beautify beautification projects. They, those are the things that make me happy. Um, it makes it like it removes me from the military and it gives me a, a like I am not just the military person. I also have a different life. Um, and that gives me that, um, that that perspective of me giving back to to the community and to the people. Um, so all the volunteer events uh, that I've chosen over the past a couple of years is specifically it's for a reason, and it, it gives me happiness at the end that um, what I'm giving back. Yeah, speaking of which, so let's speak about ANSA, and this is the ANSA podcast. So can you speak about, like, what's your role within the ANSA community, and then can you actually explain to our listeners what ANSO brings to the table? Yeah, so ANSO, uh, I've been a part of ANSO since uh, when I was in Grand, uh, Grand. So 2016, 2017, that's where I first heard about it when I was in New England um, chapter. And ANSO, what I'm doing right now, I am the, the Navy representative uh, the, for the officer side. So I'm I'm always provide, I'm trying to figure out ways to make our Navy better, to provide opportunities um also in the betterment of the recruitment and to stay in the navy how to stay in the navy because at the end of the day we want to retain great people great talent and sometimes sad to see talent go um and to bring the talent to so another organization where we could have used the talent in, in here um what but captain me about also is the mentorship the mentorship that you could ask and you could and seek and there's people there available um that will help you out for whatever uh route you want to take and i love the enlisted in the officer community that ansa provides that is exclusive that i haven't seen in other organization of uh, either you're an officer you can only be an officer program or you unless you could only be here and enlisted and that's what ansa has it has the wealth of enlisted and officer because that is what the true talent is the enlisted and the officer together as one um so for my role as, as the navy service rep is i mean providing those programs that is available to, uh, speak about if there's any problems or anything like I'm able to bring that up to um, to our president and and see what we could do to make our service better or make our 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 organization to work as one with other maritime services. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I know I'm an army dude <laughs> doing this for ANSA, but I think uh, the vision for Lieutenant Colonel Montalban is expanding ANSO beyond the sea services now to include, to be more inclusive, not only for officers enlisted, and now he wants all the branches to join, um, like Army, Air Force, even Space Force, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it's a great it's a great vision that the ANSA has and they provide the mentorship more more than anything, like provide the mentorship for those that need. Um, now, before we start, like, and Alex, Alex appreciated for, for being here again um, in, in our podcast. For, for before we actually head out, so let's talk about your future aspirations. So looking forward, what are your goals within the Marine Corps and beyond? Uh, my inspiration, uh, so I want to stay as long as, as possible that me and my family is able to uh, stick together. Um, if it's going to be 10 years, 15 years, uh, that's great. Um, if it's just eight more years for me as a commission officer, um, then that's great. It's, I think it's what drives me is to, with the family to ensure that we're both in the same, in the same, um, we're aligned. Uh, but what I'm trying to go is uh, e either right after the ship, uh, work maybe for Navy legislation um, or go overseas. Um, that'd be great. I think uh, having that experience and bring my family overseas is, uh, is an opportunity or maybe go uh, go back to working at the Pentagon or BUMED. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the collective community that's there. 
DC area is really nice, and I I will go back in a heartbeat if I can. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in Richmond, so I'm like two hours away from DC, and I, I spend a lot of time in Richmond. I'm sorry, in DC, so I know it's a beautiful uh, area. Uh, and I know they established in the Elsa DC chapter now, so <laughs> kudos to, to to the people down in DC. Uh, now, what what advice would you give to listeners that are looking forward to join to any of the military branches and they're thinking about it? Um, I I think it's a it's a great if for anybody. It's from a kid who was you know from LA. Uh, my mom had me a very young age. I had nothing. I didn't have a bed until I was a boot camp. So um, the Navy has provided me a lot of different opportunities. And it's basically the opportunity. It's rich with opportunities. Whatever you want to be, you could definitely do it in, in the Navy. Um, you could also go from enlisted to officer. You could be go from enlisted to warrant officer. You could go to another service from uh, Navy to Army. Like, I think it's just is the community itself. Um, we're always trying to improve, become better, and at the same time to provide back to the service, provide back to the country. Um, I think it's that's rich. I don't see other organizations how we call brothers and sisters a family, and we're there for them no matter what. Um, Friday night, if I'm alone, I'm able to call a friend. Hey, what are you doing? Let's go do this. It's it's just the great the community service, um, the community to the country. I, everything's great about the organization. Yeah, most definitely, and and definitely uh, look for a look and and get more information about any branch that you're thinking to join. Uh, there's plenty of information out there, or you can talk to anyone that is is in the service. Uh, one of the point of this type of podcast is to show that we are any other human beings. We're in the services, and nothing happens. Uh, Alex is being Alex has been in the in the Navy and all Marines since 2008. I joined in 2012, and we're still driving and striving in our careers. Um, now, lastly, before we close out, for those that actually are in the service, uh, a piece of advice to join the ANSA community, what would you say to them? Uh, for the ANSA community, um, please message us, interact with us, engage with us. Um, we're there. We want to engage. And I've, I've received a lot of good emails when I send my uh, monthly emails. Um, to engage and I, I, I love I love hearing from everybody uh, from a different aspect around the country people who have been in in the military or they're that have been get, have gotten out um, engage with us let us know let us know if, uh, suggestions concerns uh, because we're there for you um, this is the purpose that I'm I'm one of the board of directors for Navy because I am trying to make sure that we advocate our issues to where it's supposed to be at well, Alex, I appreciated your time uh, for being uh, today here at the Answer Podcast. Again, uh, any other co uh, closing comments before we actually wrap up? No, thank you. I appreciate you uh, for staying up late night for me. Uh, you know, it is Japan. Uh, but thank you very much for what you do. Thank you, Alex. Um, then I'm going to close out. So thank you for joining us today um, on this episode of the Answer Podcast. We hope you found Lieutenant uh, Sandoval's story as inspiring as we did. If you enjoyed this episode, be, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Uh, we'll be back soon with more stories of our leadership and dedication from the men and women who serve our nation. Until then, stay safe, keep striving uh, for excellence. Let's go, mi gente.